Uh, Reverend Dr. Jin Lee is a private practitioner at the Living Council Limited and serves as the vice president of Korean American Wellness Association. Jin has been working as a professional counselor since 2005 and has been serving as a pastor to various churches in the Chicagoland since 1998. He received an MA in counseling psychology, MDiv in pastoral studies, and DMIN in church parachurch leadership. His approach to therapy integrates clinical, theological, and leadership perspectives based on the nature of the client's needs. As a 1.5 generation Korean American immigrant, Jin also understands the cultural dynamics in mental health among Asian Americans and is passionate about serving them. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Jin Lee. And Jin, the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And uh, I, I hope and I've been praying that this time will be uh, edifying to you. And already I, I was participating uh, or watching the uh, the morning sessions and um, it, I'm just filled with so much encouragement and the fact that we're talking about it like this, I think is so cool. So I know our time is limited, so I'm going to go ahead and share the, the PowerPoint and, and jump right in. So give me one second here. Okay. And here we go. Okay. Well, trusting that uh, you can see everything well. Um, <clears throat> I'll begin. All right. So it, it is a pretty uh, interesting topic, isn't it? Uh, mental health and spirituality. And even during the morning session, I think some of the questions were uh, raised around this area. So I'm going to start with a quick, uh, call it an exercise, but I came up with a uh, fake story and uh, just I apologize for all those who may have the name Chang. It's totally random, made up. This is not you. Uh, but I'm going to read it, and I'll, I'll, you can read it with me. And then just think about your first impressions in terms of how you think um, or how you would define the problem, maybe. So here it goes. I'm Chang, and I've been feeling depressed lately. I have a hard time concentrating at work, and I'm having marital problems. We are newlyweds. My wife complains that I drink too much. I had issues with drinking since college. I really want to quit, especially becoming a Christian last year. I really want to live as a good Christian, but I keep disappointing myself and my family. I just keep feeling that I'm not good enough. I felt this way with my parents and now with my wife. I cannot shake this idea, uh, shake off this idea that I'm never going to be successful. So what do you think? Is it an issue of mental health or spiritual health? Uh, due to time, I'd love to take a poll, but uh, due to time, I just would love to just kind of hear you drop your thoughts on the chat box. Um, if you think it's, this is a, this is a case of a mental health issue or I think this is an issue of spiritual health issue. So you can drop it, but certainly be thinking about it because uh, I think we'll come back to it and you'll see. Oh, I see a lot of both. Mental health, both. Okay. All right. Keep, th keep that in mind. Okay. So here we go. So actually, Dr. Kim addressed this. So uh, I'll just say it briefly, but we do want to understand what mental health is. And According to World uh, Health Organization, it is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities and can cope with the normal stresses of life and can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So you've been introduced to it. So I'm going to go to the next slide because we'll come back to some of the implications of this. So that's mental health. And then what is then spirituality? And now this is really difficult to uh, come up with a, a single definition. And I'm sure there are many different ways that you may define it as well. But I'm going to use this 
particular definition from uh, the resources mentioned below. And it says this way, it describes the whole of, of the lives of those who have responded to God's gracious call to live in fellowship with him. I'm going to pause and have you reread that and just kind of think about that a little bit. The whole of the lives of those who have responded to God's gracious call to live in fellowship with him. Spirituality. So then what are the implications? Again, not that this is the best um, or the only definition of spirituality, but we'll use it to talk about some of the, the similarities and differences between mental health and spirituality. First of all, I think the goal between these two words are quite different. Based on the definition of mental health, it's, uh, it's safe to say that the overall goal uh, for someone who's dealing with mental health issues or challenges is to increase quality of living, right? To realize, realize the meaning of life itself, to, to realize things about themselves, self-awareness. Coping has to do with being able to manage your stress and a uh, certain mood uh, challenges, to be able to work and to have that self-sufficiency, to be able to provide for yourself, and to be able to make a contribution. In other, in other words, to be able to live with a sense of purpose. So whatever is getting in the way of doing that, improving those things to increase quality of living really becomes the, the main goal of mental health. But spirituality, given its definition, it's these are my words, but it, it kind of can be summarized as uh, the goal will be to live with God and for God, to continually live with God and for God. And so if the aim is to be able to live for God and for God, these topics below becomes relevant. The issues of justification, someone who... Uh, still doesn't know Christ and helping them to understand the gospel, to help them to be reconciled to God. And, and then once they believe and have been justified, to help them in this process of sanctification, whether that's being discipled or teaching them and equip, equipping them to know how to make disciples, topics of repentance. And that's a daily thing, isn't it? To continue to to uh, ask for forgiveness and seek restoration as, as we each day lean into the goal of uh, loving God and, and living for his purposes, loving his people, and so on. So if the goal of mental health uh, it could be about uh, to help people to have control of their emotions, have good cognitive functioning, and, and to help them to have positive in interactions with people around them, spirituality, right, to help them love God, love others, and to help them live faithfully and righteously. So we begin to see some of the differences between these two words. And then that shapes the roles of those positioned to help in the mental health field. And, and those of you who are on this call are pastors and elders and deacons and church leaders, um, the goals of mental health and the goals of spirituality, I think, shapes uh, your roles. So for the mental health professionals, I think there is a certain level of authority, but it's more coming from pro professional authority. And so when people are coming to them, their goal is to, to treat whatever uh, disorders or problems and to help them to you know, either work through or, or, or work around those challenges that's preventing them from living uh, life with quality. And so here's some terms that are uh, recognizable to you, psychotherapists and um, clinicians, counselors, and psychologists. And the difference between psychologists and say, uh, psychotherapists, although they can be psychotherapists, uh, these are doctors, these, these professionals have a doctor of psychology and much of testing and assessment are pr primarily done through psychologists and then we have the psychiatrist 
who are uh, medical doctors, and this is um, who we go to for medication and um, when you have to lean on that. So these are doctors who can only prescribe. And so if the mental health professionals are there to treat these problems and challenges to help people increase their quality of living, well, the role of pastors and el elders, you're not there to necessarily treat those problems, right? And the authority that you have, it's more of a spiritual authority where it's less about treating, but I think it's more, it's to guide them to the counselor, our Lord Jesus Christ, and um, and all the wisdom and truth that he has to offer and that his scripture has to offer. So these are obviously common titles and roles of shepherds and disciplers, counselors also, mentors and teachers. So the main thing that I, I, I want you to take away is uh, the difference in the role is that one is to treat and one is to guide. And I'm not trying to box people into it, but these are just helpful ways to understand the, the differences. And so uh, those are some of the differences. And here's some similarities, though, however. Uh, whether you're a mental health professional or a pastor, I think both require a, a deep sense of empathetic posture. Uh, both do quite a bit of educating and equipping, encouraging, enlightening. Um, so I think those are some similarities that we can share. But I want to come back to the differences a little bit because um, uh, one of the key differences when it comes to helping them, I think how we define problems are one of the, probably the largest uh, difference that you may you may experience. So, for example, when when some when when Chang said that he's been feeling depressed, right? When you hear a congregant member who's sharing with you that they have been feeling depressed, how do you think about what the problems may be? A mental health professional may be more readily thinking in terms of a mood disorder. And then uh, for non-clinicians or church leaders, you may be thinking about uh, potentially a case of someone being spiritually distant, you know, from God or things like that. So I think how you look at the problem and how, how you define the problem certainly can be different. And then that'll impact what the solution is going to look like. And then some of the differences between a mental health professional and a church leader is that both of you have a level of insight into the family background that can be quite different. For mental health professionals, uh, you know, they may um, get a lot of uh, information through intake and interviews and getting the family history. But notice it's very one-sided. You're just going by their own report, right? Just their, their words. But you may be in a position where you may actually know the members of the family and some of the historical background because either they have been with you a long time. And so that kind of insight is incredibly helpful and valuable. So as church leaders, you're able to have uh, insight into the family background, some in many cases, a lot more. But in some, in some cases, mental health professionals may know a lot more because the clients are sharing with them things that uh, that are so private, so personal. Um, so the level of insight is different. And then the length and duration of counseling session is also very different because in the church, it may be hard for you to establish a long-term therapy uh, rhythm. It, it may be hard for you to meet on a weekly basis for an hour, hour and a half each time. And those are some of the things that counselors can do. And so there's some differences as well. Another difference is the counseling modality. And I think this one may be a, an important thing for you to keep in mind. Uh, for mental health professionals, their role primarily, it, it, their goal is to treat, but the way they counsel is more or less facilitating them through uh, and, and, and uh, through these challenges and helping the clients be able to understand uh, what some changes they may need to make. And no one's really telling them what to do. 
But that's very different, isn't it? As pastors and uh, count, uh, or, or elders and just leaders of, of a church, whether you're a small group leader, even sometimes as a as a, someone with that spiritual authority, you may be more um, able to be more directive. Like for example, I, I put an example of infidelity. That's a tricky one, right? When, when a client or a patient shares with you that they are having an affair, right? You can't you can't just tell them. You can't rebuke them, right? You can't tell them what they need to do to get out of this toxic, you know, relationship. Uh, pastors can, right? You can you can talk to them more directly about what is right, what is wrong. Um, so, but in that example, a uh, even though a counselor is not able to quote unquote rebuke them, uh, they may focus more on, or they may look into the underlying motivation behind the affair. Like, what is going on that has caused you to make such compromise or make such decisions, and help them to, you know, work through that and hopefully work out of that. Um, but the pastors or the church leaders are able to uh, speak directly. And so those are some really different way of helping that we could notice the difference between the two. So the question is how to collaborate with one another. And it's easier said than done because of uh, these differences. When, when these differences are, uh, you know, uh, you, when you collaborate and you can sort of fill in the blanks and, and can, you know, understand kind of your lane and your space, it can be a beautiful thing, but sometimes it's hard. And so before we get into some of the specifics, I just wanted to provide some quick tips on how to seek, how to find uh, counselors you can collaborate with, and then some of the steps that may be helpful for you. So first of all, these are some common sense, but I just, I just had to say it. Number one, you gotta do some research. If you know, if they have a personal website, uh, look it up, read it, and then most professionals are uh, on Psychology Today. It's a pay subscription that most of us uh, sign on because it's it's a helpful way to get the word out. So you can read their profile uh, pretty decently on there. And then here's a big one. You got to call them and see if they'll be willing to uh, give you a free consultation, even if it's 10 minutes. I think talking to them will be very helpful. Don't just rely on Google search. For example, if you look in your area, the Christian counselors in this area, if you Google it and just go by that search, I know that has a lot of stories where it hasn't ended very well because they may say that they are Christian counselors, but there may be a lot of things that may be misaligned. And so uh, call them and then prioritize the fit between their training, what they were trained to do, and the treatment needs, specific treatment needs uh, of your parishioner. Um, when, when looking for a specialist, um, it may be hard to find a Christian practitioner for every single special needs. If someone needs something specific for trauma therapy, someone needs something specific for eating disorder or uh, addictions, the, the pool of Christian professionals uh, can be smaller. But um, I say prioritize the need because just because they went to a school that is good and school that you recognize and approve of, doesn't necessarily mean that they have the specific training to meet the specific needs of your congregation. So think about that. And then um, it, it is totally appropriate to ask about their inclusion of faith or spirituality in their treatment plan. You want to ask that because you'll, you'll get a variety of um, uh, response in terms of uh, their, their comfort level or their integration of faith. Some may say, well, I'm comfortable with uh, including spirituality, or uh, we may pray at the end of the session, um, but that doesn't give you necessarily insight to their modality for helping, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So some of the sample questions that may be helpful for you is to say things like, hey, do you include a faith-based approach in your work? Some will say no, and that'll help you to know that even though they are Christians, the 
professional services they're providing doesn't necessarily include a whole lot of faith-based perspectives. And it might be helpful for you to know that. Uh, another sample question is, do you use the Bible or, or re make references to it during counseling? And it'll make more sense once we go through these five models of Christian therapy. Um, but if they are adamant about only using the Bible for therapy, that's going to give you some insight to their philosophy and approach to how to help. And that may have implications uh, for you. And then, uh, if possible, you can ask them casually, you know, where their membership or if, if they're active members of any local churches in the area. The reason why I include that here, you're trying to get some feel for their theological background. For example, um, uh, I interviewed a counselor in the area, was looking for a Christian counselor. And, uh, you know, uh, by talking to them, I found out that they are more from the Catholic background and the people that I wanted to refer uh, were from the more of the Protestant background. So some of those alignments are some things that you do want to think about. OK, so that's part one in talking about the, the differences and similarities and uh, how to collaborate. Um, this next section is going to talk about the integration models. It's not necessarily a comprehensive one. But I'm going to use this particular book to just give you five examples of how Christian counseling can look. Here, as we talk about this, you want to think about your own assumptions. Do I tend to think more like this? Um, and how do I, yeah, just assess your own assumptions. And then uh, it'll help you to know the type of questions to ask when trying to collaborate with other Christian counselors it'll help you to kind of gauge their general approach. I'm going to tell you these categories, no one really uses them to, to, to describe their modality. Uh, and no one really just, I, want to, I don't want to say no one, but rarely uh, like w one person just sticks to one. Most of us kind of utilize uh, different approaches from all of these things. Uh, and there are some who, who are more on the extreme end, but, here it goes. So here are the different uh, approaches to um, think about. By the way, I'm going to give you a PDF copy of, of uh, this PowerPoint slides at the end. So you don't you don't have to try to keep keep up with all the details. I'm not going to even read it all, but uh, just try to catch the big idea of each of these approach. One of the five um, that's taught in, in this book um, counseling and Christianity um, is called the levels of explanation approach. And uh, this is one of the more common ones amongst Christian psychologists. But here, the, the, if you think about it, the levels of explanation approach is saying that reality is multi-layered. So, for example, defining human beings. You can look at it from the atoms, just the physical makeup. You can look at it from the chemistry makeup. But you can also look at it from theological lens and talk about the Imago Dei. So what it's saying is that science provide support for the Bible and theology, but it occasionally will challenge some of those teachings that, that the scripture will have to say. So there's a bit of tension that this model will wrestle with because it acknowledges that knowledge comes from scripture, but it also comes from experience, tradition, rationality, and science. In theory, ideally, all of them should resonate together in harmony. For example, Proverbs 17, 22 says, a joyful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. We, uh, there's, there's studies on it, your personal experience says it, uh, the scripture says it, everything can agree that, yeah, joyful heart, man, good for the soul, mind, body, and a crushed spirit, whew, you'll feel it, right? I mean, so it's a truthful statement that all levels of truth uh, can agree with. Um, and, um, but at the same time, because they are treated separately, 
Um, this a Christian professional who primarily approach therapy from this point of view, which is very common, uh, Bible or Christ is seldomly referenced in therapy. Um, it utilizes more the empirical data, testing and assessment tools, not because they are against the Bible, of course. It's just that they are seeing the, they highly respect and utilize the scientific uh, resources and psychology. So they're just holding all things together uh, in tension as much as possible. And uh, I, I mentioned some of the, uh, the key contributors to each of these models. So that's levels of explanation uh, approach. Um, I feel like we may have some more questions about this later, but let's, for the sake of time, let's uh, just move through all of them and then we'll process together. Another approach, it's called the integration approach. And it's not an integration between psychology or science and the Bible. It's, it's between science and Christianity. In other words, it's not trying to integrate every scientific knowledge with finding like a proof text in the Bible to, you know, uh, harmonize. It's not trying to do that. Um, it recognizes that there's not going to be a precise harmony between psychology and the Bible. But this too respects the scientific findings. But the therapy, the way therapy is done, is done in a way without compromising loyalty to Christ and Christian truth. Earlier model, it's not that they're min they're uh, going against it, but they may just present things in tension. But this model goes a little bit more where clearly the theological framework uh, and the loyalty to these Christian truths goes ahead of science, but has feels the freedom to utilize resources that may, you know, from the secular background. So uh, this approach would say that we may need to sometimes modify or reshape the things we learn in psychology in light of our Christian beliefs. Just a quick example is, I'm sure you've, many of you have heard, you know, the Freudian uh, concept, you know, Oedipus complex. Uh, Freud uses a term Oedipus complex to describe a child's desire for their opposite sex, uh, parent and feelings of envy and jealousy, resentment and competition with the same sex parent. So psychology or, or, or psychologists will come up with these theories and ideas that gives in insight to some of the uh, things that are going on. But this approach uh, respects that, but modify or reshape such findings to understand, yeah, that I can, that's kind of getting at the sinful nature. So we're not necessarily ascribing to the Oedipus complex, but we look at findings and studies to say, yeah, that's that's what sin looks like. Even, even babies are sinful. And for those of you who are parents, you, you know you can testify to that, right? So um, again, it, pr it prioritizes theological framework, but freely uses the secular resources that apply, that fits. And so this is what the integration approach can look like. Third one is called a Christian psychology approach. It's, uh, there's some three steps that they lay out. Number one, to retrieve Christian psychology, make it our own, to make it biblically rooted uh, understanding of the human nature and disorder, to conduct empirical research within the biblical Christian tradition, and then step three, approach counseling based on the Christian psychological studies. A quote from this book, uh, good research done from this perspective can make Christian psychology a worthy intellectual competitor to secular psychologies. And so there's some notable uh, organizations um, with this mindset. But at the end of the day, big, biggest difference between this approach than to the, uh, the previous ones I just mentioned, is that they really uh, emphasize that Christ is the one who holds the power for change. And amen to that. We all uh, believe that. But this really shows up in the counseling uh, session, the way they do counseling. 
uh, the Christ lordship really is emphasized, thus making the counselor a representative or a conduit of this power. So that's going to change the way they, um, even their posture for helping, it's going to change. And it makes the therapeutic goals uh, more in line with this idea where there's a greater emphasis on helping people to live a sanctified life um, uh, is the greater priority than anything else. So Christian psychology approach comes from more from this perspective. And uh, we have the transformational approach, and it can also be called a spiritual formation approach. If you're familiar with spiritual uh, directing, I think that model emulates uh, this approach most closely. So it's sometimes it can, the, the, the helping and the, the change agent, how change happens can feel very subjective, very different than levels of approach. That one is more clinical. Here's the problem. Here's what you need to do to kind of get this treated so we can improve these things. This is more subjective where it really works with Christian clients because it is grounded in Christian realities, first of all. And uh, there's a great emphasis on your personal relationship with God and others. So a quote that I want to share with you says, spiritual disciplines that foster our union with God are a vital part of being a psychologist in the spirit. Uh, I'm just going to read through the levels real quick uh, because it's really it's really different. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, a, really a highlight of this model. Level one, transformation of the psychologist. In other words, it's putting the emphasis of helping primarily on how uh, intimately and how uh, how much the psychologist or the counselor or the helper or the pastor how full is he of the spirit? His intimacy with God and righteousness is one of the biggest factor in helping this individual uh, change and help and heal. Um, and I think that's one of the notable things. And then it's saying do psychology, do psychology in God, led by the spirit. You're not just kind of going through, here's, here are the three steps to you know, make you feel better. But you're really listening to God and, and, and being that conduit to uh, know what to say and how to say it, led by the Holy Spirit. And then using the relevant body of knowledge that includes scripture and theories, caring for the soul, moving them from theory to praxis, and introduces a model of training in transformational psychology. In other words, going back to Chang, if he comes in and he's saying, He's depressed. This this counselor will focus on helping him, you know, improve and help him to feel less depressed. But the therapy doesn't stop there, because the ultimate goal is not just to help him not feel depressed anymore. In this approach, the ultimate goal is uh, spiritual formation, that he becomes more like Christ, loving God. And loving his people. Lastly, the biblical counseling approach that you may be familiar with uh, sees the Bible as a self-sufficient counseling manual. So it's not just something to, you know, share a uh, scripture here and there, just to make casual kind of references here and there. For this approach, the Bible is the manual to to help people. And so there are three key assumptions that make up um, this approach. Number one, God is the maker of all and truly knows and uh, um, and to truly know and to love him is to, to be fully human. Second, the Lord is the judge of the living and the dead, knowing and evaluating us completely. And third, Christ came to us for our salvation. Again, I'm going to share this document so you can look over these things, but uh, this approach is uh, evolving. So there, there are those who uh, present themselves as uh, biblical counselors who come from the more traditional model. And then there are 
biblical counselors who are more progressive in nature, where they are more integrative. So they are uh, including some of the um, uh, the you know research and resources that uh, has been proven to be helpful. And so some of this they do emulate things similar to the integrationist uh, model. Uh, key difference is that this uh, for folks you know, using this approach, their therapy style, as I mentioned earlier, right, generally speaking, mental health professionals try to facilitate rather than being directive. But this, this model is unique in that they do take on more of that spiritual authority and, and can be more directive and sermonic um, in, in the way the counseling experience uh, is, is felt. So those are some uh, distinctives of, of this approach. Uh, let me give you one example, just in case this is confusing to any of you. Um, for example, when someone comes into counseling with uh, certain sexual abuse or trauma, um, one of the differences that you can see is that someone from biblical counseling approach, as, as they are trying to help them to heal from this trauma, they may actually bring, help them to think about, imagine Jesus bring Jesus into that memory of trauma and to help them, uh, you know, lead to forgiveness and, and redemption. And so they're more deliberate to, to help them to recite certain passages and, and literally bring images of Christ into that trauma. Whereas a, a different approach, um, especially the levels of explanation approach or even integration approach, they may focus on uh, helping them to desensitize or reprocess those traumatic memories and will address how the brain uh, reacts to those trauma. And so they may be doing certain work and using certain uh, methods to address the brain and how trauma memories are stored and reprocessed and things of that nature. So they're focused on brain um, in this approach, uh, they're, they're focusing on how God's word and Jesus can help them to work through those trauma. So I don't know if that's a helpful example. You can see both Christians, both with the similar goals, but approach can be very different. So uh, I don't know what this is doing in you. I know our time is, is almost time is almost up, but I do want to get to our helpful tips. Uh, being a pastor and a counselor, I felt like uh, looking at the congregation from the pastor's lens, just having some of the insight, some clinical insight may be helpful. So I want to really get to it. And I'll try to just work through really fast to leave room for uh, some Q&A. But again, I share those approaches with you to get you to think about just, first of all, your own assumptions about the goal of helping and how you may just naturally uh, approach doing that. And so if you uh, have certain assumptions about, you know, how healing is accomplished or how healing happens, uh, that's going to shape the way you help, but also that's going to shape the way you collaborate with other uh, Christian professionals. And then when you get to that point in trying to discern who might be a good fit to having your network for people to refer to. Uh, knowing about these approaches will help you to ask questions to help you discern what might be a good fit. Okay, so let me just kind of uh, give you these tips. Hopefully, some of these some of these things will be helpful for you. These are just some things to keep in mind. Um, some of the things that I think mental health professionals do because of their training that church leaders may not do naturally is, the, is these three words, psycho, bio, social. Mental health professionals are looking at uh, the congregant or the client or the patient from these lens, lenses. Um, naturally psychological, it, it's things of the mind. I mentioned trauma because trauma has a way of impacting or how we see reality. And, you know, it, it really does shape their sense of reality. And 
things of identity, existential, existential crisis. That's things of the mind, your belief, your thinking, your perception. So look at the mind and then look at the biological component. Uh, look at the, see if you have any insight on their family history of mental illness, things like bipolar, schizophrenia, borderline. These aren't things that uh, you just kind of pick up. These, a lot of these things are her hereditary. Terry, so you, you want to be mindful if any of the family members have any of that. Um, e even medical conditions will impact your mental health. Gastro problems even will impact your mental health. Personality, right? Things you were born with, going through puberty. This is not just in the mind. This is something that's changes that are happening that's impacting your mental health. Postpartum, postpartum. Something happens, substance use, you put something in your body that is impacting your mental health. So that's biological, sociological. Pay attention to the, the family dynamic, birth order, immigration, divorce. All these things are social, sociological uh, aspects that's, that may be impacting the mental health. So if anything, just think psycho, bio, social, and look at your... Uh, church members, when they're coming to you from these three lenses to give you a quick assessment, and it may help you to know which ones to prioritize. Depression and bipolar, probably you'll see a lot of this uh, in, your, in your church. But here's some quick tips. Depression is a little tricky sometimes because in kids, it may show up as oppositional behavior. So here we have a kid who's actually depressed, but they're getting reprimanded or even rebuked for being, you know, incompliant and rude and mean. Uh, men, it can show up as anger or avoidant behavior. So here we have, let's say, husbands who, uh, who are being told by their wives to, you know, that they need to go, you know, do anger management when that anger really is pointing at more, you know, feelings of deep sadness and depression. Women, it can actually show up. Depression can show up in excessive spending and drinking. So here we are complaining about how, you know, they, they're always shopping and, and, and this and that. They may actually be depressed. Seniors, depression can show up like early signs of dementia due to memory loss and a difficulty making decisions. So here we are. We have seniors uh, who are actually depressed but being uh, assessed for dementia. So uh, these are just quick things to keep in mind. Uh, bipolar, I, I'll just, feeling the pressure of time, we're running out. Um, the highs and lows, it's not just highs and lows. The highs and lows uh, usually are days and weeks in between. It's not just about someone who's just like switching their moves left and right. Anxiety versus panic attack. Just keep in mind, anxiety at the end of the day, it's talking about fear. So when someone's anxious, you want to ask them what, what their greatest fears really are. And that'll help you to uh, get a better sense of the source. Panic attack is intense. People talk about it as if they're, they're, they, they literally feel like they're dying. Um, so take it seriously. If they have no experience with it, best to call 911. But if they are experienced with it, uh, usually they know what to do, but ultimately medication will be needed for something like that. Suicide ideation, suicide attempts. I'll just make some key highlights here. When people, people talking about dying, um, that's common. And if they're talking about it, that is a, that is a cry for help. So it's, it's actually a good thing when someone actually verbalizes something like that, uh, Cutting self-harm can also be a cry for help. So just because someone's talking about it or they start to cut, uh, you don't have to freak out so much. Like they're going to you know, commit suicide right away. Uh, it is cry for help, so pay attention to those signs. But self-harm is not always done in cutting. Uh, eating uh, disorders is a form of self-harming. And then also isolating themselves, social isolating Isolation is also a form of self-harm. If people all of a sudden, your congregants congregant all of a sudden, they're not talking uh, about wanting to die. They're telling you how they're going to do it. Okay, that's a bad sign. 
that's it becomes a lot more urgent at that point so you you want to make sure that you give proper attention and care get family involved and take them to the hospital if um if, if you sense that bit of urgency the 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 attempts are most um dangerous when when boys or men attempt because they actually succeed because many times of the method of suicide uh, i'll say this one more thing um look for drastic changes obviously when someone has been doing pretty well and it turns really bad i mean you can just tell they're not themselves at all uh that's that's a bad sign but some one that we don't think about is when someone you've known them for being super depressed usually bad it's more normal for them to be in a bad place and all of a sudden they go from bad to superb like they are extra happy they're more social than that they have ever been before um you want to pay attention to that because it could that very sudden change could indicate that they are actually saying goodbye that they have made peace with themselves to to uh go through with it and uh that's that's something that you want to uh, pay attention to in the church sometimes uh you do want to be watchful because that radical transformation sometimes is praised uh and that's good because sometimes it's seen as a personal revival it could be but just in case just be watchful okay uh probably don't have enough time for this but when thinking about Chang, uh, just wanted you to think about these things. Having talked about the different ways to define the problem, different uh, approaches, um, all these things. If we were to think about what Chang's going through, ask yourself, what kinds of questions would you ask now compared to um, you know, your first attempt? And then what would you like to know more about? having the things that we've talked about in your mind and then which state statements now jump out at you and then how would you define or prioritize the problems uh at this point so maybe these are exercises that you can do uh once you receive the pdf and just see how um, just assess your own assumptions about how to help and so there we have it similarities differences between mental health and uh spirituality um have included some helpful resources we talked about the different approaches and hopefully some helpful tips so um uh, that's my website and phone number you'll have any questions you can uh feel free to ask but uh sorry it went a little long you know it's great thank you so much uh reverend dr jin lee Let's um, show our gratitude. Uh, you can uh, use some of the emojis. And we have 10 minutes. And I want to encourage folks to go to the Q&A chat and begin you know, reflecting. And if you have a question, to voice it in the chat. I'll begin as people are sort of processing their thoughts. So Jin, it strikes me that earlier in the morning, Dr. Kim was urgently advocating for the need for greater mental health literacy, especially among our Asian American faith leaders. And your workshop has wonderfully delivered upon that um, mental health lexicon. You gave such rich frameworks for understanding biblical and sort of um, uh, scientific approaches and how they might be coordinated. So one of my questions is, what happens if we don't have your lexicon, if we don't have your uh, frameworks for integration? What are some of the common mistakes you're seeing in the, in the ministry when people confuse things or are not as uh, attuned to the different roles and responsibilities and goals of, uh, of a professional therapist and a minister? Yeah, I would say, you know, when it comes to doctrine, you know, be dogmatic, hold on to your convictions. When it comes to helping, hold your initial conclusions loosely and softly because there could be more. So, you know, like you may have that initial impression about, ah, this is why this is happening in you or in your marriage. 
and, and, and out of that, you may have some strong directives on, therefore, you need to do one, two, three. Um, just slow down a little bit and, and, and learn to ask a few more questions just so that you are responding appropriately to the, to the main problems that's, that's being presented. That's what I would say. Great. Very helpful. Here's a question. Let me uh, put it on the stage from Sun. All five models seem to be based on some biblical truth. What is your opinion on which model may be the best fit for today's cultural context? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that word best is, is what, what's, uh, <laughs> what's difficult. Uh, makes it difficult for me to respond to that. Um, I, I, I don't know, but um, in today's culture, believe it or not, all of those approaches have its place. And um, I, so I would actually move away from seeking what might be best, but maybe look at your immediate context and consider what may be most um, feel relevant and more helpful in navigating those conversations. So feel the freedom to walk between all those approaches to just choose, pick and choose what's good and helpful and uh, just keep the main thing, the main thing, because they're all based on biblical truth. You and I, we all know that God is the counselor. The healing, healing comes from God, right? But how we facilitate uh, those help can be many different ways. So feel the freedom to utilize uh, many wisdom. God makes it you know, available to us. Great. Here's another one. Um, let me just... Okay, here we go. This is from Christopher. Referencing your example of discernment, could you provide some guidance on how to better discern um, how problems are defined? Mm. Yeah, um, I, I think it goes back to asking good questions, right? Going back to Chang, um, you, you know, if, if I was... Used to, I was to use that psycho biosocial lenses, right? Asking questions based on that would have helped me to discern. In, in, in his case, if there is some issues with addictions, like he has problems with drinking, like how much of that actually plays a role in this marital context and his mindset and so on. Uh, but as you probe, if, if, uh, some of those things, I, the, one of the most bothersome thing about that example is that he truly believes that he's not good enough. Uh, so that's getting into his existential like framework of how he defines self. And if that, by asking those questions, if that is getting at this uncertainty or lack of theological understanding and convictions of how he understands himself in light of God, well, then then going there to help him you know, establish a stronger foundation and knowing who God is and who he is in God, that's a good starting point. So I think how to better discern is achieved by asking good questions. Here's another one from uh, Chris Morris. It is a long and difficult process for someone to accept a referral to a counselor. How can we do better at this? How can we coach others who need to see a professional? Yeah, and since the pandemic, this has been a great challenge. So practically speaking, there, there really is no good solution in terms of the long wait list. It does not mean, however, that uh, especially the church has nothing to offer. So what I would do is if, if a counselor is not available, the next tier that you want to think about is a, a pastoral staff member who may, who may not have a clinical training, but has God-given talents for many of the counseling-related uh, shepherding type of skills. You know, set up a meeting with them to see if they can at least have that dialogue. And if that's not available, look at the mature Christians in your church and see if any of them will be able to just be able to provide that space to talk. As I, also, I also think, Jin, that the questioner is asking, 
what if there is resistance on the part of the person who actually needs the, the professional oh, help? Oh, so, so how does how does one kind of do the referral and kind of uh, help them seek professional help, but maybe they're they don't think they have a problem or they're resistant to the idea? How how does one approach that difficult situation? Yeah, then we we try to you know identify the obstacle. Is it financial? If so, can the church come around that? Right? Is it fear? Right? What what kind of fear? Fear of a whole lot of things. Address the fear, and uh, I, I would yeah I would see if if you can identify the specific uh, nature of the obstacles. Um, I would go there first. Yeah, that's really good. All right, last question. Um, this is from Carol, um, who says, how can we encourage other churches to address mental health? We have a friend whose church leadership will not support a mental health ministry support group. So this is kind of a similar question, except, except that the one who is resisting is a, a church. So how, how do we advocate for churches to... Uh, be inclusive of mental health resources and conversations? Yeah, the fastest changes that I've seen um, is when the senior leaders are experiencing the value of counseling. So um, I think, you know, if they utilize and participate in, in, in sessions like this and seminars like this, I think it'd be really incredibly helpful. But um, I think it's helping the, the, the senior leadership understand, again, their own assumptions about what's happening because a lot of them probably also have their own set of fears on what may happen. Some of them don't feel like, or feel like all of these are, are their responsibility. It is the responsibility of the pastors to help treat these things. Um, and then some of them fear that as soon as they refer them out, that um, whatever is being done in the counseling will go against what's being taught in the church. And there are cases like that. Um, uh, that's why you want to, you know, vet out the, the right helpers. But I think approach these conversations with your pastors with great deal of humility mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, approach it in a way where it's coming from a place of empathy for them and to see if they, they trust you enough to or bring in someone they trust to open up about their own concerns and fears. And I think that's a good start.